we have 40 minutes for our panel. Um, the idea of the panel uh, was to jumpstart some discussion, but I am sure that uh, over the past, uh, well, yesterday and today, uh, there have been a lot of questions which haven't been asked because of time and because of this uh, evil chairwoman who won't uh, allow an extra 30 seconds. So really do take the occasion to uh, the opportunity to ask questions, not just to the panelists, but also to other presenters. I'm sure everyone will be very happy to uh, uh, answer and consider your questions. We're going to just start the conversation, um, and I will ask the four members of the panels to briefly highlight, uh, highlight uh, one of them, each of them, what they think has been the, have been the key problems and the possible uh, key solutions or perspectives that you guys think we should think about once we eat our flights home. Thank you. So, Summer, would you like to start? <laughs> not, 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 not really, actually. <laughs> no, I'll guess you from abroad. I see. Is anyone else from abroad here? Randy! <laughs> You ready, Randy? Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I'm actually going to ignore the instructions and instead, and instead try to think of things we have not discussed that are very important. And um, one thing I think we haven't talked much about uh, are certain resource issues having to do with cybersecurity and cybersecurity expense and division. And what, some of the odd things is that the most wired societies are going to be the most vulnerable. Therefore, they're going to have to pay the most in cyber defense. And that uh, then creates a situation where relatively uh, primitive uh, foes can inflict enormous cost, even without launching their cyber weapons, just by their existence. And this, this is very bizarre that these possible weapons could force uh, uh, advanced societies into spending enormous amounts that are, in, to some extent, do no good. They don't do any additional good for their society. Another issue I think we haven't talked about uh, is possible privacy implications of various cyber defense initiatives. Uh, when General Keith Alexander was asked about these tens and hundreds of thousands of attacks on uh, Department of Defense uh, computers, uh, a senator asked the question, is it true that more than 50% of these come from the U.S.? And he said yes. And what's happening, of course, is that they have botnets and their U.S. computers are being used as pivots. It's, it's not that they are uh, U.S. citizens are initiating these attacks, but this kind of uh, this kind of problem on this scale uh, would suggest that the uh, government should be more proactive. The government or the internet service providers should be more proactive and go out and find out which com computers are infected to block this from happening. Uh, this would. Um, raise certain privacy implications, checking out people's computers. Uh, the only regime I can think of might be that uh, the internet service providers are made much more liable than they are now for damage uh, from their users, uh, and they could require their users to be disinfected periodically, or they, they could examine the computers. But these relatively modest measures uh, have not really been tried. I know my universities do it. Sometimes before you even connect to the lo local net, uh, your computer is scanned to see if it's run the most recent software. But these are incredibly easy steps. And uh, the huge number of attacks that cost a great deal to defend again seem to be just cases of sort of poor hygiene. Uh, and the the, the the remedy is not curing the illness. The re remedy is immunization. <laughs> okay, sounds an interesting topic. So I'll ask the other members, members of the panel, uh, if they have any comments on it, and then I uh, also ask the, you guys in the audience to intervene if you like. Hugo, about this uh, last point. Uh, and, and okay, this is a specific point about uh, ISP's liability. I disagree. 
uh, before uh, touching, so to speak, Article 230 of the Telecommunication Decency Act in the United States, Article 520, uh, Section B of the DMCA in the US, or Article 15 of the European uh, uh, E-Commerce Directive, uh, I would think twice. Because mm -hmm. in legal terms, uh, they have represented uh, over the past uh, 96, uh, so 17 years in the United States, over the past 13 years in Europe, uh, uh, the legal pillars uh, for the internet uh, uh, as we know it. Uh, and if you want to destroy a free internet, uh, well, uh, technically speaking, start uh, destroying high speeds and unity. So I disagree. Uh, in general terms, uh, but I know that there are a lot of people out there that are willing to uh, uh, consider high speeds as the new shares of the web. And, uh, well, the debate is over. And in general terms, uh, Rosario, I would say that I noticed the specific bad, bad uh, to the good old law of physics, uh, talking about the cyber war. The gravitational force of the debate, uh, maybe because of this wonderful uh, building. Hold on a, mo a moment, Hugo. It's going to be a general point, right? Yep. You have to bear with me one moment, so we can keep on focus. Michano, do you want to comment on this one? Oh, because I got it wrong. Please go ahead. <laughs> That's correct. No, go ahead. That's all right. Sorry, I apologize. Uh, uh, that is, trying uh, to observe all this uh, from the outside, uh, uh, the dramaturgic viewpoint, uh, uh, quoting the Jürgen Habermas, uh, uh, which makes sense in Italy. Uh, well, this debate uh, was on uh, ethics uh, of a cyber conflict, uh, and so the gravita okay. uh, gravitational force was that from conflict, uh, we mainly focus on warfare. Little about the very idea of uh, conflict. Uh, few conflicts uh, represent uh, warfare, although any kind of warfare represents a conflict. And so it's very telling the fact that uh, nine out of 10, uh, me included, uh, to, uh, have focused on this specific kind of conflict. And then in the same way, on ethics of cyber conflict, from ethics, uh, most of the time, uh, we discuss in terms uh, of law. And in fact, before, about your uh, own presentation, there was a very uh, uh, specific misunderstanding, uh, because you were talking about moral rights uh, most of the time, uh, uh, whereas uh, uh, someone uh, were uh, talking, uh, hearing the word right uh, interpreted uh, that in terms of uh, legal rights. And so in a way there was a kind of a misunderstanding out there. But even uh, talking about uh, legal rights uh, and uh, the law, uh, another striking point is that most of the time focus was on military law. No specific reference to constitutional law. And uh, as far as we are still living under the rule of law, according to the hierarchy of legal sources, military law is subordinated to constitutional law. Please don't forget it. That is when we are talking about uh, the laws of war, they are subordinated to basic constitutional legal uh, rules. And this uh, was uh, another trend of the debate uh, that there was uh, very telling uh, and I would like uh, to stress. Just briefly summary, so we have issues concerning the threat posed by not so rich and not so powerful country, which may be dangerous as well for pow powerful country by means of cyber, and issue which might come uh, to uh, endanger privacy and individual rights uh, in order to keep the safety of the information infrastructure. Did I got it right? And then um, issues regarding uh, both the topics of uh, the conversation we uh, held during this worship. Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, bring up. So. Uh, paradoxically, even if I disagree with you, then by stressing uh, uh, ISP responsibilities and the like, uh, in a way, I have to agree with you because we are talking about uh, the constitutional basics, uh, uh, which are at the core of our debate. Okay. 
and uh, also the relation between military law and constitutional law. I'm just serving up so that we can keep track. So this was the, my right-handed part of the panel. Let's see what the left-handed part of the panel is. <laughs> uh, sure, I, I could uh, perhaps make some comments about the, the cost economic uh, dimension. Unless I'm mistaken, a major part of the industrialized world was, certainly this is true of the United States, brought to its knees in an economic collapse <laughs> fairly recently that was information based. Uh, the vulnerability there, and I think I'd agree with Randy in that regard, the, the vulnerability is, is astonishing and it's only a few years later we seem to have forgotten about it as if it never happened. I mean, when, when you're dealing with a situation where the, the, the incorrect information regarding uh, housing appreciation being perpetually unsustainable and information about derivatives being uh, misunderstood, misgaged, mismeasured, uh, leading to a, a situation we're still not really out of, um, it's amazing to me. Uh, and that should probably teach us something in connection with cyber and with potentially cyber, cyber warfare. Um, and so if it's uh, low-tech non-state actors or maybe they're, 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 they're state actors, I mean, this would be the place where I, <laughs> where I, would, I would attack. Um, so that's just to amplify in, in, in uh, some degree what, what, what Randy's pointing to. Jesse, John? So following instructions about uh, offering uh, a couple of thoughts about the, the day and a half. I've learned a lot, I disagree uh, a lot. And um, uh, one point that I think I've learned is that if we were to force uh, everybody in this room to go for a yes, no answer to two questions, we could map uh, each of us uh, on a four squares diagram. Imagine that blue thing on the X and Y axis divided by four, and the two questions are, has war changed, yes, no, on the X axis, and do we, then, do we need to uh, change uh, radically, dramatically re reinvent uh, our ethical, legal approach to war? Yes, no. Now, if you uh, think for a moment in your mind about whether you go for a yes or a no answer to these two questions, you know in which uh, small square in the big square you position yourself. You could be the most conservative uh, person in the room. You are at the bottom on the left. No, war hasn't changed, and no, we don't need new legal ethical principles. What we have are more or less fine. War is more or less what we've always been uh, looking at. Now, we kill each other, and uh, we try to do that decently. Or you could be the most innovative person, uh, top right. You can say, war is a completely different business, and my goodness, we need to invent a new ethics to deal with this new business. Now, somewhere, somehow, of course, each of us is not in that square. Each of us is way more refined, way more intelligent, way more nuanced, sophisticated than just a yes, no answer to two simple-minded questions. But you start from the simple to go to the complicated, uh, the complex. So I think that I've learned that uh, when talking to someone, start from the assumption, which square are, am I in and which square are you in? And can we find some kind of a middle ground where we can possibly do some good uh, business? In terms of good, doing good business, that's the second uh, thought that I would like to uh, offer, I'm afraid that uh, if I had to place myself somewhere uh, forcefully, uh, as in you no know, kinetic forcefully sort of decision to be taken with a gun against my head, uh, then I would probably put myself top right, as you can imagine. Yes, it's a new kind of war, and yes, we do, new, we do need pretty much new uh, ethical uh, perspectives on how to deal with the novelty. Um, I hope you will concede, as I concede before that, of course, each of us, myself included, we are more sophisticated than that. Having said all this, what do we do about this? Well, one thing that I learned uh, from yesterday and today is that some people uh, are more, uh, and some people are less ready to embrace uh, radical ways of thinking, as in really unhinging your way of thinking. 
and unhinging here means moving from a Newtonian modern perspective about how things work and are in themselves to a, oh, I wouldn't call it postmodern because if you say post, uh, you don't really know what you're doing, you're just saying you're coming next, uh, but rather sort of different, uh, use your terminology if you prefer something else, uh, perspective about how we deal with reality. If the world is not made of things because things do not really exist after all, that's what physics tell us, by the way, um, well, we need to rethink uh, how we deal with ourselves and the world and our, forgive me for this bad word, metaphysics. That's the bottom line. Unless we change our perspective on how we conceptualize the world, our metaphysics, our ethics, and therefore our conflicts will be hard to grasp if you, like myself, are in the top right square. You can be Newtonian and happy with the things the way they go if you are at the bottom left. Thank you. I, I just want to say immediately that you don't have to put a gun to my head to put me in the top right, right, right box. I'm, I'm, I'm there with you. Um, <laughs> so, um, now that we are clear on a few points of discussion, may I ask the audience whether there are any questions, points, remarks you would like to uh, put forward? Uh, okay, so Sandra is going to break the ice. Thank you. There's, this is a, to go from the sublime to the mundane, a very uh, pragmatic question. There's been an underlying assumption throughout this entire event that, uh, that NATO or any of the NATO countries uh, could operate within the internet in the way that it would like to if it chooses to, uh, for purposes of the kinds that we've been talking about. That all rests on the assumption that the internet continues to work and that actually the, that the history of the US uh, thumb of control over the internet sustains. Um, one of the least uh, mentioned news, major uh, world-class news stories of the past month is that the U.S. has lost control of the internet. The future of uh, governance, internet governance, is completely unclear and quite chaotic. And the future of the internet in terms of its technical functioning is unclear. If, um, if this uh, circumstance of chaos and turbulence continues, uh, internet governance declines, internet functioning declines, what happens to the kinds of arguments any one of you has been making? May I just stress something before? You, so, I'm not sure why you were bringing in the NATO thing, but uh, the, the, the comment you were making about the NATO being able to act in the internet the way they want if they decide to, well, it's not just the NATO, I mean, it's every political authority. Of or course, political party. Just, so just because, I mean, they have that was not the important part of the question. Yeah, no, it wasn't, but it's an important specification. So anyone in the panel um, thinking about or? Well, I, I may be misunderstanding the, uh, the, the, the question. I, I, I could immediately concede that any particular network, internet, whatever it is, is intrinsically fragile. I mean, it could theoretically go down, it could evaporate, et cetera. But that really doesn't, at least in my case, that was your, your ultimate question. That really doesn't threaten, I don't think, the fundamental claims. I mean, I, 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 if it's information, um, I should be able to think about it mathematically using the basic mathematics of information and computation. And whatever is, there, is possible there uh, and feasible could eventually just be rebuilt. It could be a different network, but if it's information, um, then those are those those would be just bumps in the road toward the kind of scenario that I that I see in the future. Um, so that would be my 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 sense of a response to your your question. Uh, I don't I don't think there's too much danger that I see yet, uh, so long as whatever authority there is in the internet is distributed and weak. Uh, now, it's automatically distributed in some ways because of the way the Internet works, the pathways uh, fr from any one point in the infosphere to another. Uh, there are many, many through many different countries. So it's almost inconceivable that uh, some party could gain control and change it. And the policies have been very, very liberal in terms of the amount, what kinds of information there's been minimal control over names. That's the only thing, that, that where there's real control. 
that has to be established and that has certain sites. Uh, but I don't, I just don't see any problem. Uh, and the fact that it's not U.S. anymore, uh, that's hardly surprising given the fact that our NSA has probably infiltrated many of the U.S. owned servers. <laughs> okay. well, what, do you want to, you don't have to, I mean, if you, Well, in, uh, in a way, last year we uh, observed uh, last uh, meeting in uh, Dubai, the uh, ITU versus ICANN conflict, uh, whereas uh, half of the world, I mean, sovereign states, uh, attempt to divest uh, ICANN of its power. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, well, in a way, the internet uh, that we used to know in the early 90s ended uh, a lot ago. Uh, simply consider a big player here, China, and how uh, China's uh, internet uh, represents uh, our port. On the other hand, the cyber world doesn't uh, completely depend on the internet, uh, and so there are uh, two connected but uh, separate issues. Okay. Bill, I believe you have a question. Yeah, um, I think that there's always a danger when you're either holding a conference or writing about new and emerging technology to look at the new technology in isolation, in isolation by reference to what's happening elsewhere in the world in armed conflict generally, so to speak. The way I see it, warfare in its traditional, very kinetic, very nasty form is going to continue for the foreseeable future and well beyond it. I therefore come from the basic proposition that what one needs is a body of law that is capable of applying across the spectrum. A spectrum which starts with the most um, non-sophisticated, non-technologically informed kinds of warfare, right the way through to the sorts of futuristic hostilities that we've been discussing. I don't see a public policy um, incentive or benefit in seeking to hive off a particular way of conducting hostilities and arguing that particular rules apply. I think there is a public policy, I mean global public policy incentive in having a single identified set of fundamental principles that apply across that spectrum. And my final point would be this, that even if one were to argue that ad hoc specific rules of some sort ought to be developed by reference to a particular novel kind of technology, I think that states in general would come to the conclusion that that body of law would need to be providing some sort of protection and that the people and objects that need to be protected would be those that are basically out of the fight, that that therefore would presuppose protection of civilians and civilian objects and therefore one would essentially conceptually be going round a continuous loop and bringing oneself back to the basic fundamental protections that the existing law of armed conflict with which we're familiar, um, that, that that body of law consists of. Now, that's where I'm coming from, from what I regard as a, as a pragmatic approach, if you like, to the world as I see it. And I think if one's coming up with um, an ethically or philosophically based construct one needs to convert that construct into something that policymakers can live with, can articulate, can implement, and can implement consistently with other things that are going on in the world, i.e. a reality check. Now, I, I readily accept I'm, I'm the elephant in the room. I'm the lawyer in the room, okay? And I would say all of that, wouldn't I? Okay. I did say it. Okay. So thank you very much for our knowledge, your presence. It was about the time, about time.
Uh, uh, sure. I'd like to add um, a comment to um, what you just said, uh, which uh, one of the points with which I agree, having said uh, this before to you personally. Um, just in case someone uh, had the wrong impression, uh, or not, that when we talk about changing our conceptual perspective, we are talking metaphysics in the wrong sense of the word. It's, oh, it's rubbish, I mean, surely you know, we need to go down to the basics. Uh, point number one, uh, there's not such thing as the basics without metaphysics behind, so don't be mistaken. It's just that metaphysics is less visible. Point number two, consider the following just a simple element, and I'm uh, talking about a actually very interesting talk that Rousseau uh, gave us. We have a difficulty, and now I'm um, trying to be pragmatic myself, in identifying objects when cyber conflicts are in question. Well, that's because when we describe objects the good old way, we think about those objects, and Rosario reminded us about this as well, in terms of visibility and the five senses. If you touch it, if you kick it, if you smell it, that's an object. Otherwise, well, something else. Well, what about, for example, just changing the definition in terms of interaction? If it can interact with something else, that is an object. All of a sudden, your database is a perfectly fine example of an object, and anyone destroying a database is destroying an object. Bingo. Oh, wow, that's what I mean. That's exactly what I mean. But what I also mean is that behind these two positions, visible, touchable versus interactable interacting, there are two Western metaphysics. And unless you discuss this, you may not want to. And you may want to leave this to some ivory tower, boring stuff done in the library. But behind, there's a major shift in perspective. You're moving from one side to the other side. If you find the other side more convincing, as I think you know, some of the talks in the morning were pushing us to uh, open our minds to, well, that's what I'm actually suggesting that the solutions that the lawyer and the military and the scholar are providing are inviting us to shift our perspective, for example, about what counts as an object. And we have a long list of things that we need to reconsider. So I'm embracing the position, if I got it right, that that's the right way forward. Uh, you may have a reasonable I think Randall would, wants to. Yeah, yeah, this might be a new theme, but uh, one, um, one theme I heard often in many papers, and especially in the last paper by Maria Rosario, is uh, cyber warfare as a problem of sublethal. That was one of the phrases used. And um, part of the problem was the word, the words. I criticized the use of attack. Uh, as Tadeo criticized the use of violence as applying, defined down or deflated, she said. And I do have a suggestion for a word that can be used, and that is force. It seems to me there's physical force and there's other kinds of force. Mm -hmm. And if, say, Russia cuts off natural gas, stops natural gas flowing through one of its pipelines, so long as it doesn't violate any existing contracts, that's within permission of the UN Charter to unilaterally break with trade or communication with any other country. But clearly those are uses of force. They're trying to change the behavior of another country or uh, trying to punish them for some past be behavior, but it is not uh, physical force of the usual form. Sort. It's not lethal, for sure. Could, could, and I know that is a different theme, and it's an important one. I, just to, to, to go, go back here, that's probably anticipatable <laughs> that I'd return to us. Sorry. Um, there's a symmetry here, because you're, you're speaking, as you, you uh, concede, from professionally who you are and what your roots are. So I, d I just will parallel that. Uh, by speaking as someone familiar with, with AI, and this is uh, you know, sort of the party line. Uh, there's a great article in The Atlantic that appeared recently about Douglas Hofstadter, primarily, but it takes into account the current state of artificial intelligence. We have to realize that if you took the market capitalization of Google, 
Microsoft, Yahoo, large parts of Apple. Um, we are talking about the start of a revolution armed with tons of money. These companies have taken AI from basically uh, a complete ice age to a situation where no one in this room can perform professionally in their job without employing the power of agents to figure out uh, how to be more productive. As an attorney, you have to be searching using the internet. Those search agents are all AI. So I just, you know, I, I not only respect what you're saying, I agree with you that there has to be adaptation that leverages the wonderful foundation that we have erected on the public policy and legal side. But at the other, uh, on the other side of the coin, um, we kill people with drones now that are pow they're controlled by human beings. There is no reason why those drones cannot fly themselves. There is no reason why those drones cannot find low-tech non-state actors and kill them autonomously in 2013. What's going to happen 10, 15, 20, 30 years from now? Our, our cinema tells us what's going to happen. And just to repeat, what I'm saying is we need to take account of that reality now. Um, and, and so I, I think there's some notion of an agreement, but it's, there's a parallelism, I think. Attorney, AI person. Yeah, thanks. OK, thank you very much. So last few minutes. Um, Alexander. OK, thanks. In the interest of disclosure, I'm in the lower right corner of uh, Professor Froggy's uh, matrix. But anyway, the question is for Dr. Taddeo mainly. In your presentation, you started with the definition of cyber warfare. <coughs> that makes a lot of sense to me. In particular, cyber warfare is something waged by nation states. And that was even underlined physically in the presentation. But later on, you introduced the notion of entity in infosphere, implying in a way, if I understand correctly, that any entity can wage cyber warfare. Am I correct? Uh, I'm afraid not. No. Uh, so I so want to, to be clarified in that. Uh, yeah, so two things. Uh, 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 for the sake of uh, simplify the presentation and uh, not take too much time, I didn't, if you know the state was written with a lower case, and that's not just because, uh, you know, philosophers would like distinction, but um, even when I think about stake, a state uh, and I think about the current and possible developing of political uh, institutions, uh, more than nation state, I will think about political authorities, actors or entities with political authorities. I mean, okay. say that when we come, uh, or we get to the infosphere and to the information ethics, informational entities uh, are something quite uh, well defined. We talk about ontological entities, so stuff that exists. And so if you say that any uh, informational entities uh, can wage warfare, it means that everything... I was asking. It, it means, what you're saying, what you're implying is that everything seen from an informational perspective can wage warfare. This computer, my pen, uh, this chair, and that's not correct. So that's what I wasn't understanding. So I was asking. For that. Yeah, and no, no, it, it would be so wrong. State so it was with the lower case, so it's not state. It's national, any actor who has political authorities. So we can think about state. We can think about European Union. We can think about multinational or supranational. Private uh, entities, corporations. No, no, uh, political authorities. Political so authority. authority. That's what makes the difference between warfare and, as States I say, states and supranational entities. Multinational, yeah, the European Union or okay. any kind of sort of that understand the way. Does it clarify it a little bit? Yeah. Great. Any other question? Last two minutes. It's like, <laughs> speak now or never. Uh, the gentleman at the bottom of the room. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Um, I have got a question in terms of uh, the ethics and the law. Usually the tool needs to fit the purpose in terms of uh, if you want to make highly qualitative machinery, the tool needs to be able to do that. Now in terms of uh, the infosphere, and uh, maybe I would argue there is more, even more than one infosphere, and it's the glue between and around all the other spaces. Um, how should that work in, in the future with the law and the ethics? Because if you look at um, cyber warfare, it's all in seconds, and in milliseconds, uh, where you have uh, that would also mean the law would have to come in seconds and milliseconds. And the ethics, and is there maybe even more than one ethic 
you apply at different points in time? Yes, because we'll be talking about, about this very point with Europol next week in Paris. And uh, ethics and the law, you know, Antigone, two millennia and a half ago. And this has been the trouble with uh, the very connection about ethics and uh, the law by giants like Hobbes, Pufendorf, Thomasius, Kelsen, Kant, Hegel. So the reason why such giants couldn't solve the problem I would suggest that uh, maybe we have to grasp the problem in a different way. Otherwise, uh, it would be very tricky that someone in this room could uh, solve the problem that uh, since uh, the ancient Greeks uh, to modern times, nobody could solve. By the way, it's very uh, funny because uh, an Italian, maybe one of the uh, most brilliant Italian philosophers uh, last century, Benedetto Croce, used to define your problem the Cape Horn of legal science. How can we approach this very problem? Uh, I would suggest to uh, distinguish between plain and hard cases. Uh, luckily enough, we have tons, a number of cases of uh, uh, legal and moral interaction which are pretty plain. Eh? So that uh, uh, let's focus on a very, hopefully, but luckily, a uh, restricted set of hard cases in which, at times, uh, ethics and the law, uh, because they overlap, uh, may clash. Uh, because since, uh, uh, in a way, this workshop started uh, uh, addressing this very issue, believe me, if we didn't solve this problem over the last two millennia and a half, uh, there is a good reason for that. Okay, thank you, Hugo. And uh, so I'm very happy to say that I'm going to close this workshop right on time, 10 past 1. I accomplished my mission. Great. Uh, thank you. Yes.